Okay, let's try to reorganize that. All right, well, that'll have to do, I guess. Um, okay, so let's take a look at Axis Empires. That's totally okay. And I send so. And I'm not going to pull all the stuff out. I can show you kind of, you get a lot. You get a lot in these boxes. Three big decks of cards in each one. Tons and tons of counters. Really, really dense, heavy, good quality rule book. I, of course, managed somehow to destroy, oh well, to rip the uh, front page of my uh, Total Oak Creek one, which really pisses me off. But it's really, you know, sturdy. If I didn't have it kind of balanced here and it fell off, all that weight coming down on it, that's what hurt it. Um, quality of the components, almost everything is, I'd say, mm, uh, Certainly 80s quality, at least, you know, we're not talking about anything in, uh, you know, the counters and everything look like they could have come from WIF or Advanced Third Reich or something like that. Lots of colors, lots of different, uh, you know, ease of distinction, etc. But no, well, actually some of them remind me a little of the WIF counters. You've got kind of these pretty little, uh, Pretty little pictures on the on the airplanes. The boats, not so much. So, but you know, a little bit of a little bit of color in there if that's what you like. The cards are a little flimsy, but that's okay. These aren't decks that you shuffle. These are you have this whole pile. They're just your selection mechanism, and I think that works very very well for the game to have them on cards. The original game uh, for Total or Krieg, at least I don't know about Krieg. The original Total Oak Creek had somewhat larger cards, which probably is actually um, even better in terms of holding lots and lots of information. Uh, these cards tended to refer into the rules too many times, and that was really one of the, the aspects that I faced a lot, was all the references into the rules. The rules themselves are... They're ambitious, I'll give them that much. And they mainly manage what they're trying to do. Uh, what they're, they're, it, it's an attempt to do this uh, procedural where method of, of, of handing you the rules where everything is exactly when you need it in the rule book. Now that goes until the lookup rules segment, which is, uh, what does this do, what does this do? What's the problem with it? Well, Oh, I don't know if there really is one, um, because a game of this weight and magnitude is just going to be a pain in the butt to learn, no matter what. And this is my first playing, and you saw a lot of that frustration there. This is not an easy game to pick up, there's no question of that. Uh, you're talking about something on the order of magnitude, of a whiff of an uh, advanced third Reich, and I think that blows. That's something I want to talk about. I think that World War II games of oh, I don't know, you know, this is 60 pages of rules, whatever, but of this kind of scope and and magnitude, blow away the level of detail that almost all games from earlier eras are going to cover it in. And you could say that about a lot of different parts of World War II. It's like World War II, in general, we go into so much more detail with. Is there really an ASL? People talk about great battles of history being the ASL of the ancient world. It's not. You know, it does not hit that level of detail. And it probably, ASL's got its realism issues, right? But beyond that, it does try to capture this tremendous layer of detail. And... Yes, there's all the fiddly aspects to great battles of history, but they don't manage the same level of detail. You're not talking about a few men, you know, and trying to position them. And likewise, I don't think, even at the abstracted view that this is, compared to, say, a World in Flames type game, I don't think that I can think of any game prior 
let's say World War I here, because La Grande Guerre actually manages uh, to come pretty close to that World War II level. Uh, but in terms of detail, in terms of, uh, you know, investigation of specific units, perhaps, and their strength points, yeah, in this, everything's fairly abstracted. You could say you've got kind of that kind of coverage in maybe some operational games or some particularly detailed uh, Napoleonic games, for example. But take Empires in Arms, which is almost always taken as the, ah, oh, this is hugely complex war game. Look, it just doesn't compare to what's put out there for World War II. And for good or evil, um, and there are simpler World War II games, there's no question. The original Third Reich was not this heavy. Um, and if you go and look at something like Hitler's War, it's actually a fairly light game. This reminds me of Hitler's War, not in terms of, uh, you know, the detail. Look, this is a 60-page rule book, 65-page rule book. Hitler's War is, I think, 12? <laughs> um, but in terms of sort of the scope level, this very strong abstraction, especially on the support units, although you have that over on the A3R side, uh, even up to the advanced Third Reich side, what you don't have that in is A3R made the decision, yeah, we're not going to use that same abstracted system over in the Pacific. And I went into this in a lot of detail. This system, this game says, we're going to keep the same system. We think the system is right. And we're not going to say the focus in the Pacific should be more on those carrier battles. I find that a little discouraging. I really enjoy aspects of how this game plays out. Um, and again, to me it seems like a modern rewrite of the old Third Reich, where the ground units are in some detail, fairly significant detail, and then the support units are handled very abstractly. In World in Flames, especially after they, you know, get down to dune buggies in flames or whatever you know, the most recent expansion is, they keep taking one little segment of the game and saying, ah, let's do this in all the detail we can. So ships got that treatment, planes got it, leaders got that treatment, where, you know, now, if you have the whole collection, I'm not sure you have, you know, a single level le uh, layer of complexity and detail. It feels more like a bunch of little bumps. Well, with this, it feels like the land detail is a little bit more... Um, so, it feels like the, the support unit detail and the air unit detail is more on the lay level of Third Reich or, I'd say, Hitler's War. But the ground unit detail is a little bit more uh, focused. I think that works great in, in the European map because when it comes down to it, that's a ground war. But when you get over to the uh, Pacific map, I think it is kind of an issue, and I feel like A3R and, and uh, Empire uh, of the Rising Sun made sort of the right choice there to focus in on that naval battle. Now, I found this, I found Dicenso much easier to play, and I actually like it as a standalone. I think it's an interesting game as a standalone, but I am kind of bothered about the balance. I feel like the whole island hopping campaign becomes something very different. One thing I brought up there, you end up placing your support units, you know whether or not you're going to get your invasion on an empty island or whatever. The midway situation. You know as the Japanese you can win or you will lose that. Well, you don't know that you'll lose because you don't know what the enemy is going to, how much they're going to commit in terms of counters. They could just keep playing against you. But on your last counter, you know you've won, right? <laughs> Once you've wiped out their naval power. Or uh, you know what's at risk here. What you don't know is how long it's going to be out after you lose or win or whatever. And you very seldomly will make uh, an invasion attempt or uh, 
an attritional attack like that. Although I could see somebody doing so, putting something in a position where the enemy can't let it go and has to play against it. And then, well, if you have a better turnaround time, you can deal with putting them out of commission briefly. And I think we saw a little bit of that. Um, so beyond that, what do I think of it otherwise? Uh, gosh. <laughs> It, you know, it, it is a totally new system. It is very different thinking behind it than there is in most war games. Yeah, you've got some of the same stuff when you're playing, you know, on, on that ground war. Some of the same ideas, but they translate into slightly different mechanisms uh, for how to move, you know, and how that exploitation and everything works. There's another thing, because the procedural... Uh, format. Everything's very, very focused. You must do it in this order, you must do it in that order. When you start looking at the way people talk about it on the boards at Consum World uh, and, and at, at Board Game Geek, it's very much the, ah, uh, here's this trick to get this, and in some cases, and one, one of my little rants went off, although I think I can get comfortable with that, the, the situation at this point. But, what, you know, Things that I thought should be almost natural, the invasion of Denmark and Norway, you should just be able to do it. Well, you can pretty much, but it's not immediately obvious from the rules. And I would say, I, I think I ran into the same problem in World in Flames, by the way, where I remember, I, I don't remember precisely, but I think it may have been either Denmark or Norway or the Low Countries, with this oh, how can I take them out? And I had kind of that with this in terms of Poland. How can you take them out in one shot? I don't know. I didn't get to try here, but I got to try a couple of times doing a Case White scenario uh, as kind of the learner scenario. And that's one of the things. I feel like this is a game that requires, and part of it is that puzzle mentality. How do I do this? What steps do I have to do, etc.? It requires much more thinking than maybe I like in my war games. And you can say, what, what? You know, these are cerebral activities you're supposed to be thinking. Nah, not for me. I kind of like to play a game where, I'm not going to say it's beer and pretzels, but where I can sort of generally say, this is what I want to do, and it's almost natural to do it. And I run into that problem with some other games. You may have seen it over on the uh, Musket and Pike series, which I like a lot, where I didn't know how to maneuver my pieces and use them correctly, and ended up just kind of getting them butchered in one scenario, even though most scenarios, my way of thinking works okay. And in this, there are a lot of, oh, I have to do steps A, B, and C before I can get this off, and I've got to think everything out and pre-plan everything. And that's great in the sense that it reflects what a military mind has to do. You know, you don't just, eh, throw some troops in. But when I'm playing a game, I want the, eh, throw some troops in to work for the most part. And here it's not bad a lot of the times. And actually, like I said, it's a, you know, as they put it, it's a remarkably resilient game. That's actually one of the issues I wanted to bring up, though. Maybe it's too resilient. So your card plays seem to give you this, wow, I can change the whole scope of history, but you can't. <laughs> you are going to fight World War II. In Europe, it's going to be a two-front war. You're going to fight the Brits as, as the Germans. You're going to fight the Brits, and you're going to fight Russia. Over in the Pacific, Maybe things were a little different. But overall, the whole flow, no matter what you do to try to change things, take all of Asia, try to come to some peace agreement by invading Russia early and, 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 and knocking them out, it still is going to be foiled by this system. The system's going to say, nope, you're going to face Britain and you're going to face Russia and you're going to face them at the same time and maybe things will be a little different. Now, 
There's a reason why I'd say that's kind of interesting, and here's what it is. Why you want this is because in some games, like an A3R, like a Third Reich, like a, certainly like a Hitler's War, um, and, and like with, there may be strategies that dominate over the historical precisely because they give you ahistorical uh, re results. And as the axis, you kind of control the flow of what's going to happen. So if you can, hey, I don't go into Russia for an extra year. Usually those games are tinkered with and tweaked so that mm, there isn't an obvious solution like that. But perhaps there are ways to make a really good push that could be a game changer. One thing I remember is in Third Reich the argument that Sea Lion could be a real game changer. If you knock the Brits out, um, you can then focus on Russia in a better way. We saw here though, trying to play it out and stretch the, the pre-war out too long, you know, I don't think that's in the Axis's best interest. I wasn't. I was kind of forced into it here because the Axis was doing poorly in Europe early on. But I think it hurt them even more. Another thing: some of the cards seem limited. You don't have that open possibilities. It's not like history's changing along with you with the game. You've got a limited deck of cards, and that deck starts getting more and more limited as time goes on to the point where you don't have the right to choose anymore. Maybe when your invasion card, when, when you're a big card for opening up yeah, the, the total war is going to come out. And you might have to bring it out at the wrong time. It might end up screwing your timing up on other cards that you won't have in your hand in time to play them. A lot of little problems that could come with that. They feel kind of artificial. Well, what can you do? You know, the game takes a broader brush than maybe some of the others, but I still think that it actually um, may provide less real options for divergence. Your deck of cards is a very, very limited set, and you don't usually have a lot of choices on any given draw because there's almost a timeline and a scripting in place there. Yeah, you could play around and delay that by playing some of your recyclable cards or something and push things a little further. Maybe you can try to keep cards in play that would otherwise get discarded with some of the uh, production directives and stuff. Not that you'll get to play them anytime nearer when you're trying to keep them in play. Um, a lot of weird thoughts and, 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 and decisions that you can make here, but I don't think too many of them are going to really violate what you're fighting. You are fighting World War II. You are fighting the World War II that we're familiar with in the history book. It might be significantly different in some cosmetic type ways, but at the very heart, it really is that World War II. I don't know if you get that same scripted position in with, and I'm pretty sure, no, I know you don't. And you especially don't when you throw days of decision into the damn thing. Now with this, maybe with the random campaign game or with options like that, things change a little bit, but now you're going to have that same deck of cards going into the war. And you're going to have the same order of choices. So I think no matter what you do with this system, like a, uh, a, a CDG, you can't get too far from history here. Again, for good or bad. I know some people who really want World War II to feel like World War II. They don't want Italy joining the Allies, right? And I can understand that. Me, I was kind of actually hoping, because of the random campaign game and stuff like that, this might be a little bit more variable game. It is. Italy can join the Allies in this one. No question there. Um, you won't see a Russia-German alliance, but that's okay. I don't think I don't think that's a fun game, right? <laughs> Nor a sensible one. Um, another thing that I felt kind of cheated about 
perhaps, was sort of the end game. I don't feel like the way the markers at the end of the game work, and not that I got all the way there, but I don't feel like the way they work tells you I won or lost the war in the same way. In fact, I don't think the Axis can win the war in this. Again, for good or bad, hard to tell. But it feel and, and maybe I'm just mistaken there. I think they have a very good chance of winning the game, but it strikes me, and, and obviously Japan is a special case because people are always arguing Japan, no matter what they did, we're going to lose. But Germany, maybe not if they took Russia or whatever. I don't know. What I do know is that I don't feel like it looks as though Germany can do the knockout blow that they do in some of the other games to either Russia or Britain, which usually is a signal that they're going to win the whole, whole shebang. I don't feel like that's available here. There's always the return of your enemy, um, which I think says, if that actually was happening, if you're thinking about it, well, you're facing an immortal foe, essentially. You can't take them out of the game. And at least within the stringencies uh, of the game. And that feels a little weird to me. It feels the no matter what, I am going to lose the war, but I can win this game feels kind of like a victory in the Pacific type scenario, which always sh uh, kind of shadows my tastes a little bit. Um, and certainly with the Mandate or the uh, Fortress Europa card choices, you're definitely saying, I'm going to play to win the game, but not the war. On the other hand, the other choices say, I think I can win the war by getting that automatic victory. I don't know if that really is winning the war. It almost feels like a fake position. I mean, what does it mean that you'd be one city further along than you were? Certainly there's a, a, a straw that breaks the camel's back, but it doesn't feel like that's the issue here. It's not... It's You know what it's not? It's not a national will-based game. and. I think a national will-based game is the kind of game that's the only kind that makes sense for a surrender of that sort. Of course, nobody did surrender in that sort of way, except maybe sort of Japan, and their will was not completely broken. In fact, the opposite. It was looking back to, game, to periods like World War I, where you see the national will collapse. So, it may be the right approach. It may be an interesting approach. My feeling on this is, it's a game that I'm very glad I have. Uh, it's not the perfect World War II game. It's not the game that brings me and says, oh, I love World War II more than anything else now. I don't think that's possible. But there's always the hope of it. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it as much, perhaps, as I have any other big strategic level World War II game. And I want it in my stable. I definitely want this. It's a harder question, do I want both WIF and A3R? I have them both now, so it's no big deal, and I'm probably going to get the next uh, the WIF, uh, whatever, Masturbation Edition or whatever it is, that, you know, is just going to be this monstrosity. But this one I'm very pleased to have, because to me, this one combines that higher level of a Hitler's War with the complexity and the detail you know, I kind of crave. Uh, I don't think it's a smaller game than your uh, A3R or WIF. Maybe a little smaller than the monster WIFs that you start seeing, but uh, the copy that I have, which is only about the same size map-wise, etc., I think it's about the same length as this thing. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I played this very slowly. My world's changed since when I used to uh, solo game. Yeah, uh, I would definitely recommend this. It's a big chunk of change, though. These guys go for about a hundred bucks each. You got two of them to get the whole game. It's about what Wipe the Master Edition is going to cost you. You're not getting as much in this as I think you are in that, but you are getting, um, you know, a design that's a little, a little bit more. Uh, 
Well, I, I can't say about with Master Edition's design, but I can say the design for this seems more integrated and more at one level than the WIF design does, and that's pleasing on its own level. Uh, I'm going to load this up. I know I've taken a decent amount of time chattering about it, and it looks to me like I'm going to either be playing something kind of short next, or well, and or SPQR, uh, because I want to get God Kings to the table and it's not clipped yet.